Welcome to Literary Libations with Librarians. And this time we are going to be sharing books that we love that are outside our regular reading comfort zones. As we're sharing our titles, they'll appear on your screen as well as the various formats that they are available in through the Monroe County Library System. If you'd like to get your hands on any of these titles, probably the quickest way is to call your local branch and speak to the staff there and they will be more than happy to assist you. If you'd like to request physical copies, hardcovers, paperbacks, audiobooks on CD, you can do that online through our catalog and that web address is on your screen now. If you're interested in one of our titles that is available digitally, there are two different platforms that those may be available on. The first is Overdrive, which you may hear referred to also as Libby. Libby is the name of the app for Overdrive. And Overdrive provides downloadable eBooks, audiobooks, and also magazines. There is also Hoopla, and Hoopla provides downloadable eBooks, audiobooks, and also movies, music, and graphic novels. And the great thing about Hoopla is if you see something on there, you can download it immediately. There's never a wait for any of those items. I am Jennifer Grineski and I am the community librarian at the Dundee Branch Library. And our introductory question for this week, since we're talking about reading outside our comfort zones, is to share something that we have done that's outside our comfort zones. So I really, 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 really am terrified of heights. Really, really, really terrified of heights. Um, and around the time Tony was about five, we started going to Cedar Point for his birthday, which seems like a fabulous idea. And most of the time I look at the rides and just go, no, thank you. I'll go stand in line for food. And when you're done, I'll have a delicious treat here for you. But the one that gets me every time is the Ferris wheel. Every time I look at the Ferris wheel and think, I can ride that, it's slow, it looks happy, I can do that. And inevitably by that evening, I've put myself on the Ferris wheel with my husband and son and am terrified and miserable within seconds. Every time, like every time it like fades from my memory, like how awful it was. I'm literally, this is me in the Ferris wheel. Like, like somehow if I'm curled up in a small ball, I'm less likely to die because I'm convinced the Ferris wheel, because the wind there gets real strong, I'm convinced the Ferris wheel is just going to keel over and we're going to land in the lake and we're all going to be smashed to smithereens. The Ferris wheel is almost scarier, I think, than like roller coasters if you're afraid of heights because it's so slow. There's too much time to you think know, about it. Yeah, you're just chilling like, oh no. You're just dangling oh, no. there. And then you stop. This and then you stop. For it's a and on and off. And maybe it's never going to start again. It's a terrible thing. I've also ridden the Ferris wheel in Chicago. And that one I thought this will be fine because it's actually enclosed. So you're like in this little, you know, cube of safety. So I got on and at first I was doing OK, but then I was convinced we were not moving. Like I was having a small freak out because I was grabbing my guys like we're not moving. I think it stopped because it's supposed to constantly move like it goes slowly enough that people can board without it having to stop ever. And I was like, I don't think we're moving. I don't think we're moving. And Mike had to keep comforting me and telling me it's moving. It's just moving so slowly. You can't see the horizon moving. And sure enough, he was right. We clearly survived and got off and I continued to live my life. But yeah, but and yet the next time we go to C Cedar Point, I almost guarantee you <laughs> that I will be like, sure, let's ride the Ferris wheel and see the pretty lights at night. Because I'll be thinking, I can do it this time. No, no, Jennifer, you can't. It's terrible <laughs> every time. So that's my uh, outside my comfort zone. Anything that's high up heights, blah. All right, with us this week, we also have Jen McCarty, who is the re a reference librarian at the Ellis Branch. And what is something you've done that is outside your comfort zone, Jen? I am strictly an indoor girl. Um, I I don't I don't particularly love nature. I'm sure it's pretty to look at, but like it's not it's not my thing. And more and more frequently I have agreed to go hiking. And I always I always have a moment like halfway, you know, we're on a trail or something where I'm like, 
you know, maybe this isn't that bad. And then inevitably, like two minutes later, there's a hill and I'm like, no, this is stupid. And why am I out here? And there are bugs and it's dirty. And there's a bench and that's my home. So that's that's a big one for me. I've I've done a lot of hiking in the last few years and I keep doing it because I get talked into it and it's healthy and it's good and nature's great and forest bathing is a thing and you should get out there. But I don't find a whole lot of peace in it. I just, maybe maybe it's me. Maybe I'm super negative. <laughs> maybe I need to be more open to the experience. But hiking, it's just, yeah. I Give me a book and, and a blanket and, you know, an indoor plumbing situation not far away. And I am much more at home than out in the woods with bugs and critters and with bugs yeah, just do yeah I, I call it like walking in nature <laughs> i don't want to do like a real hike like i'm not doing the appalachian trail but i enjoy a leisurely walk through nature and i found that i actually enjoy it more if i'm by myself like mm-hmm. if i don't have to keep track of a child or a friend or a husband or anybody else i actually just like doing it on my own i, I can but, see that but i can you, feel yeah. you on that as well but i do yeah. i like just the walking through nature i don't want it to be too strenuous just okay. enough to yeah. give me something to think about. And we've done some, I've never done anything super, super hard, but like I've done, you know, like places in like Maine where it is mountainous and, you know, it's, and it's pretty, I suppose, but it's also like, was, was this view really worth it? Couldn't I have seen it for both start? <laughs> maybe, maybe it would have been the same. Thanks, Jen. <laughs> also with us this week bleh, is Kristen Brown, a reference librarian at the Bedford branch. And what have you done that's outside your comfort zone, Kristen? So when this question came up, I immediately thought of when I was in college. um, So I went to school for uh, education in fine arts. So I had to take a lot of fine arts classes um, and I had one class in particular and my professor was awesome but it absolutely terrified me because he made you do everything so we had to make our own canvas so we had to measure and cut and i my measuring skills are i mean they're okay but my confidence level in them is not great and so i felt like i was back in elementary school where you're like trying to pretend like you know what you're doing but you really don't And you're like oh i'm working on measuring this and it was just super intimidating for me i did not feel super awesome about it and even now i still have a lot of those um, artworks i did in college and i just look back at them like oh well i mean you made it but is it is it the best <laughs> no but I- but you but didn't. You're not, you're not. You're not in art. Like you're not making campus for a living. So it ended up working out fine. But it was extremely intimidating. It was in like the old Scherzer building in Eastern, and so it was. There's just all these tools there, and I always thought that I was like this independent person. Like I can do this, and then just that ruler did not did not make me feel good. <laughs> I was like the saw. I can totally work that. Measuring out this piece of wood was super intimidating for me. So (laughs) I've kind of gotten over that fear, but I don't really measure things that often. (laughs) Well, thinking of measuring makes me think of math, which makes me think of another thing outside my comfort zone, checking my child's math homework. That's the worst. I don't even do it anymore. He's now doing eighth grade math and that is all gone to Mike. Mike has to check all the math now because I'm just like, I can't even anymore. So yeah. (laughs) I just recently had an experience where one of my friends was moving out and she wanted me to measure her furniture so she could take pictures. And I was like, are you sure you want me to do this for you? <laughs> are you it sure? Out you fine, but it did bring back some of those college memories. <laughs> Good times. Also with us this week is Ashley Lyford, who is the community librarian at the Summerfield Petersburg branch. And what have you done that's outside your comfort zone, Ashley? So I am definitely um, like extremely introverted and um, I don't do well around people, but I like there's a part of me that wants to be an extrovert, right? Like I want to be cool and do things and go places and not be afraid to walk into a room, whatever. (laughs) Um, But I'm not. So I heard about this exercise class that sounds super fun. Um, It's like dancing um like to pop music and you know totally up my alley however literally no one i know none of my friends like to dance or really exercise um so 
I had to, if I was going to do this, I had to do it by myself, right? It's in this building downtown. You have to walk up three flights of stairs. Like it's so, I mean, you get your exercise there. Um, and, you know, you go in and the lights are on and all these people, like they call themselves a squad. So like they all know each other and like they're friendly with each other. And I mean, they were friendly to me too, but walking into a room of people I don't know to then have to go and dance that I'm not good at and, <laughs> you know, like move my body in ways it doesn't move is not something that I should do, but I, I did it and I still do it. And it's, it's literally every week when I walk in, it's hard for me to walk in, even though like I know a couple of faces there now and whatever. I just, the thought, like, look, why? Who signs up to go dance in a room of people they don't know, uh, you know, when they don't even dance, really? I mean, it's just awkward. Actually, but, I have wanted to do that. Oh, it's so fun. I love it. And I won't go because I don't know anywhere. So it's good to know that you're there. <laughs> oh, yeah. No, I, I haven't gone since COVID, um, but I will go back once I'm fully vaccinated because they are doing it in person again. And it's so fun. And it's like the only exercise that I enjoy doing. Um, and I love the girl who does it. Um, like, it's, it's just a great environment. It's a great group of women. There's even a few men there. Like, I really do love it. But every week... Every time I walk in, I'm like, oh, God, this is it. This is the week. I don't know what I think is going to happen to me, but I'm like, ah, I, can't, I can't do it every week. That's it. <laughs> I have to admit that does sound terrifying. It is terrifying. I, I just, I, could, I don't think I could do that. I'd no. be like, mm, no. I mean, One I of my walk into a room of people I don't know on a, a good day, let right. alone, you know, Dance when you're going to, Yeah. One of my like legit goals for 2021 is to go to the Y and work out mm -hmm. because I've had a membership for over a year, like a year and a half. Like we got it like six months before COVID and everything shut down. Anyway, like I've never used it because I'm afraid to go by myself, yep. which is just sad. Like, hey, let's pay for this thing and then not use it because you're afraid to go by yourself. But yep. it's well, a goal. I kind of working find on it gyms terrifying. Like if all it was was like go and walk around the track, I can do that. But like all the equipment, yeah. I'm like, yeah, I'm not going to touch that because I don't know how any of that works. Yeah. And you know, heaven forbid, like I ask someone. Oh, <laughs> the funny thing is, is you spend all this time thinking like, what are people going to think of me? Because I, we had a gym membership too. And I first got into lifting and I was like, I'm not going to weight lift in front of people. They're going to be like, that girl doesn't know what she's doing. But like really people, people are only concerned about themselves. Yeah. Chances are nobody's right. really going to be looking at you, but in your head, you're like, oh my gosh, they're going to see me and they're going to be like, what is that girl doing? And <laughs> yep. That's yeah, definitely say, relatable, Ashley. <laughs> Online classes are like the best thing that ever happened to me. Now she does the classes live and I can just do it from the comfort of my home. And um, I even have to make my husband go out of the room. I mean, don't know why it matters. I live with him, <laughs> but I'm like, no, this is embarrassing. No. Get out of here. <laughs> No. Yeah. Oh, good times. We're a sad oh. little group here. <laughs> <laughs> I have to say, um, I feel like quarantine for many of us that do literary libations has not necessarily been a hardship in no. some ways. <laughs> like, no. Just I'm like, no, nope, I can do this. I'm cool with doing this, you know, virtually. Yep. So. All right, so let's get into our books that are outside our reading comfort zones. And let's have, uh, let's have Kristen get us started. Okay, um, so normally when I read, I tend to go for historical fiction, nonfiction, maybe even fantasy. Both of these books are like mystery, murder mysteries. And the first one I'm gonna talk about is A Brilliant Death. And I actually just read this with my book club. Um, I run the PM book club at Bedford and I love this book. I absolutely love it. I came into it knowing that it was a murder mystery, but not really knowing anything else about it. And I'm really glad that I had an open mind. Um, I was kind of reluctant to pick it up sometimes. Um, and that's the great thing about book clubs, right? Because you get these books and they're not necessarily ones that you would read, but you know you're gonna be talking about it with a whole bunch of people. So you read it, so you know what's going on. And so I started it kind of late and I just thought, just get through it. That way you can talk about it, you know? And I 
could not put it down. It's such a great book. Um, so the whole premise is that this woman, Amanda Barron, uh, dies in a boating accident in the Ohio River in 1953. And it's in the small um, town of Brilliant. And so word travels fast. Um, they don't figure out what happens to her. The, the tricky thing is, is that she was hit um, when her and a mysterious lover were on a boat and they get hit by this coal barge. Um, and so her body was never found. She has uh, an infant child who she left at home. She had a husband at the time who is a truck driver and he was away. And so there was this big mystery involved. So the, the child that she had is Travis and he is one of the main characters in the story. And Travis and his father, the truck driver, have a really tumultuous, tumultuous I don't know why I can't say that today. They don't have a very good relationship. His father is very abusive. He drinks a lot. He's always gone. Um, and so Travis um, pretty much just roams the, the town. And he has a best friend named Mitch. Uh, Mitch's family kind of adopts Travis. And so everybody in town knows that they are thicker than thieves. They're best friends. Um, and so there's always been a rumor going around about how Amanda died. And so now that Travis is older and he's in high school, he wants to figure out how his mother died, what's going on. And so he wants to just really know about her. So he does some digging and he ends up finding some of her diaries in his uh, father's bedroom. And that kind of leads him down the spiral slope. And so he, he comes up with this plan with Mitch and they're gonna do research to find out about his mother and how his mother died. And, um, they find this detective that ends up helping them who was working on Amanda's case, but he ended up getting fired because he falsified evidence. And so now he's kind of like people in town thinks that he's a wash up and you can't trust him. And so he ends up helping the guys get some clues, gives them um, the case files and what he figured out. And so they end up putting the puzzles together and figuring out what happens to his mom. Um, the ending is uh, a page turner. You don't know what's going to happen at the end. And honestly, this book is hilarious. The relationship between Travis and Mitch, just the whole time, it just, oh my gosh, it made me laugh so hard. Uh, there's a lot of cursing in this book. I went through, I was like, oh yeah, I'm going to find, I'm going to read directly from this book. And like most of the funny quotes had curse words in it. So I'm not going to read them out loud for you, but oh my gosh, it's just such, such a funny book. Um, I highly recommend it. It totally pulls you in. It's really character driven. Um, for being a, a murder mystery, it's not gruesome. It's more emotionally driven. Um, it was just a really great ending. And the book is set at a pace that you can really follow along with it. You get really into it and there's no spots in it where you feel like you're dropped off or if it's moving too fast. It just was a really, really great read. So if you're looking for something funny with a little bit of mystery in it, I highly, highly recommend this book. It was so good. The second uh, series that I'm going to talk about is another murder mystery. It's an Amish murder mystery, and I actually read these years ago when I worked at Maybe. Um, and so it's the Kate Burkholder series. And um, I'll just read like the little excerpt here because that kind of sums up what everything's about. So in the sleepy rural town of Painters Mill, Ohio, the Amish, the Amish and English residents have lived side by side for two centuries. But 16 years ago, a series of brutal murders shattered the peaceful farming community. Kate Burke Holder, a young Amish girl, survived the terror of the slaughterhouse killer, but came away from its brutality with the realization that she is no longer belonging to the Amish. So now with a wealth of experience later, she has been asked to return to Painter's Mill as chief of police. Um, so in these mystery thrillers, Kate must seek out the truth uh, in a society of silence and face some secrets of her own. Um, so I feel like the basics of like you have Amish and murder, which normally you don't like, it was just kind of a weird contrast that you know, made me go into that. Um, and Kate's character is really complex. You end up finding a lot about her family and and how, like what the circumstances were that she left. Um, and I just feel like she's in a really unique position because she is the chief of police and she has a background in the Amish community, but they don't necessarily trust her. Um, and so it's just a really interesting book series. I think I, 
I read up to book six before I had kind of stopped. So it, it can get gory as a heads up. It is a murder mystery. Um, and uh, apparently they made a Lifetime movie on the first three books in the series that have Nev Campbell in it on Lifetime. Um, so I haven't checked that out yet, but these books are really good. If you if you are wanting like a good introduction into crime or fiction, like um, murder mystery, this would probably be a good set because this was kind of the first series of, of murder mystery that I had gotten into, so. Thanks, Kristen. Both of those books sound like books that I would pick up naturally. I've not, I've heard of the Kate Burke, I'm not gonna say her name wrong. I've heard of that series, but I haven't yet picked it up because I think there's 12 or 13 in the series now. Yeah. And I always feel like with series, like I feel obligated to start at number one. And then I'm like, well, that's a really big time commitment. <laughs> yeah. So I haven't done those yet, but I've heard wonderful things about them. Thank yeah. you. And let's have Ashley share her books outside her reading comfort zone next. Sure. So um, normally I read like, uh, well, first of all, tons of YAs um, and like fantasy, uh, supernatural kind of books. So what I don't read ever is nonfiction. I just, I can't, I just, I don't like it. Um, I have a bad attention span and I, I, I just don't. However, I ha also had to read um, this book, Annie's Ghosts, for book club. Um, that is, like Kristen said, the great thing about book club. It makes you read outside of your comfort zone, which is why I think it's important to belong to one. <laughs> um, but this this book, Annie's Ghost by Steve Luxemburg, is about um, Steve and his mom, who uh, was like widely known for being an only child. like she everybody knew everyone in her family all her friends any like even people she just met somehow she'd work it into a conversation she was the only child um well when his mom is like in her 80s she goes to a doctor appointment and randomly mentions that she had a sister who was um in an asylum um and maybe I'm not sure if she said she died early, but it came out that she had a sister. While Steve and his sister never brought it up to her really because it kind of seemed to upset her. Um, but so then when her mom, when their mom died, it somehow came up again. And this time when it came up, they found out the sister's name. Her name was Annie, hence Annie's ghosts. So he's um, a journalist anyways. And so he really needed to find out more about this situation. You know, it's a big family secret. Like how could, how could someone how could your mother have a sibling that like she just never told you about not only didn't tell you about but like like you know made her to be dead i mean it's kind of it's kind of crazy um so that alone kind of drew me in i love like family secrets um i mean i don't want to find out my own family secrets it seems like too much for me to handle but like i love learning about other people's family secrets um, and another thing I really liked about this book is Annie, the asylum that she was sent to is called Eloise, and that asylum was in Westland, Michigan, which is where I grew up for the first, you know, little bit of my life. I don't know why I find that interesting, but it really sucked me in. I guess, I guess just having it be like a Michigan base I found interesting, and I know where that place is, um, like, I drove by it all the time as a kid, so um, I'm very familiar with it. Um, so that's my first book, Annie's Ghost by Steve Luxenberg. Very good. Um, I felt like it was a quick read. You discover a lot. There's a lot about um, asylums in general at that time, which is a very interesting topic to me also. Like, um, I just, I don't know, it's weird to me that we used to put people in these homes and just never see them again you know like you just lock them away if you weren't crazy or had issues before you definitely do after being locked away isolated by yourself um, for so long um, one other thing i want to mention about eloise is um last year maybe not last year because it was covid i have a bad sense of time thanks to thanks to covid but um a couple falls ago you could actually go to her the Eloise Asylum and what was left of it before they tore it down. I'm, I'm pretty sure it's been torn down now because somebody was buying the property. 
Um, and I thought that was so cool, but the tours filled up so fast and I never got to go. I probably would be too scared to go. I'm I'm a big baby when it comes to scary things. Let's let me just toss out there. Jen would remind you probably that I'm afraid of Buffy, the vampire slayer, the TV show. Um, I'm too scared of all sorts of things, so I probably wouldn't have really enjoyed it like I think I would have, but it seems really cool um, and just interesting. So um, definitely check that book out if you have not read it. Um, the other book I wanted to talk about is called The Marsh King's Daughter. I had to read this for a committee that I was on, which I am now no longer on. Um, it, there were so many books I uh, couldn't keep up. But The Marsh King's Daughter is by Karen Dion, and it's also set in Michigan. This is um, a nonfiction, like suspense, psychological thriller. Um, not nonfiction. This is fiction. Did I say nonfiction? Anyways, this is a fiction suspense psychological thriller set in the UP in Michigan. Um, so the main character, it starts with the main character, Helena, um, who she has her own business, like selling jams. She lives still in the UP, um, like outside of the marshlands uh, with her husband and her children, and she leads a pretty normal life. Well, eventually you discover um, well, so she's on the way to pick up one of her kids from school and she hears on the radio that someone has escaped a prison. They're dangerous. Um, they've killed, they killed two of their guards and escaped a prison. Turns out the police show up at her door because that person that escaped the prison is her father. They call him the Marsh King. So um, you find out she was raised by this man in the marshlands of the UP. So until she was aged 11, she never saw another person, never. It was her, her dad, and her mom. Her her dad had um, kidnapped her mom when she was 16, I believe. And so Helena is the product of that. Um, now, she didn't know, obviously, when you're a kid, you don't know that someone's a bad person, and plus it's your dad. Um, so she idolized her dad, like she was his shadow. Um, she loved him so much, and he taught her like how to hunt. There are some parts in this book that um, I struggled to read just because um, it's graphic about hunting, um, and I, I'm, I just don't have a stomach for that kind of thing. Um, but she taught him to, or he taught her to hunt and how to, you know, go, go around um, unnoticed, not leave trails, anything. So uh, when she finds out that he's escaped prison, which P.S., when she finds out he escaped prison is also the time that her husband finds out her back his like her story she had never told him any of that she just wanted when she when she was rescued at the age of 12 um she had to like integrate into society and she just wanted to put that completely behind her because it's also a media circus you know um i mean we've seen unfortunately how people who come out of these situations um are trailed by the media and you know oftentimes that's too much so she just wanted to not have any part of that um so she just never told him well so now he knows her dad is you know a murderer and um he's escaped prison and he wants the whole family to go away um so that they can be safe because she is certain he is he's coming for her um she refuses to go but she does send her family away and she tells her husband it's because she wants to help the police you know in case they need her help with finding him the thing is she knows that now that he's escaped the police will never find him. Um, when she was a kid, she was instrumental in getting him caught and put in prison. And um, he is so good at moving through the marshlands undetected. Like no one will, like the police have no chance of finding him. She is certain. So the only person she thinks that can find him is the person he trained her, you know. So the story um, goes back and forth between present day and her childhood um, and how she you know goes about trying to find him uh, one thing that was pretty cool i thought is um, each chapter starts with a um, blurb from the marsh king's the marsh king um, the fairy tale by hans christian anderson um, so that was cool i didn't know about that um, fairy tale prior to reading this book um, I, I just, it was such a good book. It drew me in right away. Um, and as I got near the end, I literally could not put it down. I just needed to know what happened, um, you know, and 
I wanted her to be safe and every like she all the characters were really well developed the setting um it was just so good like I said it really drew you in and there's always that interesting um little grab that it's it takes place in Michigan you know now I've never been to the UP but um it the de the setting definitely seemed legitimate um but uh overall I think it was a really good book um and I think a lot of people would like it Thanks, Ash. Yeah, I had sucked, sucked, sucked into your, your description, description the whole time. I'm like, oh, man, this I know, I know, I know. You should read it. I will. <laughs> I, I'm really enjoying this week because lots of you are describing books that I would normally pick up. <laughs> I'd be like, what? <laughs> Undine Through the Woods? And Annie's Ghost, I probably would not have, but we did that one with our book club as well. And mm -hmm. as everybody said so far that's the fabulous thing about book clubs is you end up reading things you wouldn't pick up normally because I don't naturally gravitate toward nonfiction and it really was fascinating I didn't even know that Eloise was a place that existed in mm -hmm. Michigan and the description of it um, was so interesting and how large it was and everything that happened there it was really interesting and I totally would go on a tour there so <laughs> now I know I think it's torn down now but if I'm wrong and it's not if they ever do tours again Jennifer I'm gonna have you go with I will me. go with you but yeah. I will also probably use you as a human shield when I get scared <laughs> just be with her I gotcha yeah thank you Ashley and let's have Jen share her titles that are outside her comfort zone well Ashley and I read very similar things so like she said science fiction fantasy or more fantasy um, supernatural stuff like that's that's my wheelhouse so um, one of my books is truly outside my comfort zone and one of them's a little bit of a stretch but I'll, I'll tell you why so let's start <laughs> with the one that's super actually out of it um, Al Capone does my shirts by Jennifer Goldenchenko I think I said her name right Cholden Choldenko Choldenko I think I always want to add extra syllables to it so Al Capone does my sure it's historical fiction, which is not something I read a lot of. Um, and it's also a, a J book. It's a kid's book, not a kid's book, but like a middle middle readers book, you know, like before we get to YA, but you know, we're older and we can we can handle some longer stuff, which outside of reading like with my own kids, not a place that I find myself picking my books, but I love this book. So this book follows Moose and his family as they move to Alcatraz. Um, at the height of the prison, his dad gets a job on Alcatraz Island. I can't remember exactly what his job is. I think it's maybe like in the machine shop or tooling or something along those lines. He's helping with sort of the day to day operations of the prison. And it turns out that there are a handful of other kids here, like 20 some other kids here that are families of guards or other people that are helping to make the prison a thing. It's on it's all it's an island, so they're you, someone has to run it. Um, so Moose makes a friend who's like super into this and they come up with this plan that they are going to sell the laundry services to their classmates. The prisoners on the island like are actually doing the laundry. So they're like, hey, you know, for X dollars, uh, Al Capone can wash your shirts, you know? And they like kind of take the, because Al Capone is one of the prisoners while his family lives here. Um, they take the notoriety of these really, really awful prisoners and kind of use it as a selling point. And then there's a lot more to the story. Moose's sister um, has some kind of disability. And of course, in this time period, we don't necessarily have a name for it. We just know that she's different and they really want her to go to this special school. And so a lot of the plot deals with that, trying to get her into this school where she can get some help. But it's just, it's a really, really fascinating and kind of fun book because Alcatraz <laughs> I mean Alcatraz from the point of view of a child who lives there and it's like totally normal like he a interacts with some of the prisoners like he's obsessed with finding a baseball and one of the prisoners ends up being the person who gives him a baseball to play with um and you know and it goes through I mean just the historical setting of San Francisco during this time but then you have this added thing of it being Alcatraz and being you know prisoners like Al Capone are there and it's just it's a it's a really quick read. Obviously, it's you know written for children, so it's not a taxing story in any way, but it's funny and it's entertaining. And I love this book. There is another there's a sequel. 
there's at least one sequel. There might even be more than that. Um, but it's just a really, really fun look into this world. And, you know, obviously it's it's fiction, but, you know, it's historical fiction. So there's some truth in there. And that's just really, really good. Like, I, this is one of my favorite books that I've read. And it's so not something that I would normally pick up for myself. But I did, and I loved it. I feel I, like I should go back and reread that one. I actually... Um, got to go to Alcatraz and do the tour and listen to the little headphone things. And it's amazing because all I knew about Alcatraz was, yeah, Al Capone was there. Yeah. I didn't realize like the different phases it's gone through throughout its history and the different things that it's operated as. Or when I didn't realize when I did the tour that at a time, like families were living there. Yeah. You know, that they had, had a separate part of the island where they stayed and it was like it, it was really fascinating. I think you can still find pictures online because when you mentioned that, I was like, oh, I'm pretty sure I did research on this one time. And it's so weird. Like, it, you, yeah, it is very weird to think about families just hanging out on the same yeah, island. Yeah, I have one specific okay. image in my head that I you remember. Think of it is this impregnable so rock. Weird. But like, people lived there. Yeah. It's an island. It has to be ran by somebody. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, it's really interesting. Yeah. And it's, it's a great book. It's been it a long time book. since I've read it, but it's a great book. Me too. I kind of was like, you know, like, okay, I'm not going to go back and reread it, but like, let me go back and reread it. I'm like, oh, I forgot about that. Oh, yeah, that was so, that was a cool part. It's a, it's a great book. So my second one, um, I'm definitely stretching a little bit. Like Ashley, I'm not a nonfiction reader, so I'm kind of cheating a little bit because this book is kind of in my wheelhouse, but it's technically nonfiction, which is not. <laughs> so my second book is um, North Mythology by Neil Gaiman. And what's cool about this book is I think that a lot of us are pretty familiar with a lot of North Mythology. We know Odin and we know Thor, but the way that we know them is very much popular culture. Like we know them from the Marvel movies, or maybe we know Thor from the comic books. And the way that Marvel portrays Thor and Odin and, you know, Loki is not necessarily the way the Norse myths were written or the way that um, people who might have, you know, studied this or believed this at some point, it's not necessarily the same. So Gaiman has done a lot of research and taken some of the most popular myths of North mythology, as well as some of the more obscure myths of North myth Norse mythology, and written a really, really nice book about these myths. And he's made it so that, you know, each chapter is its own little story. And, you know, it reads, I mean, I'm, I was going to say it reads like fiction. It's mythology. <laughs> so, you know, it's fanciful. <laughs> um, but it's more, it's, it's presented very, I don't know, I, I can't even like explain, like, I want to say like it's presented very factually, because it kind of is, but <laughs> it's North myths. Here's the real but, story behind, yeah, how would you explain that? Because it's, right, it's, exactly. it's like Grimm's fairy tales, <laughs> you know, like it's, there's yeah. the Cinderella you see in the movie, and then here's the real here's story the they wrote. Yeah, right. Um, I read some reviews of it, and a lot of people, a lot of scholars liked his interpretations, in part because he presented things very point of fact. It's not a lot of embellishment. It's not, you know, they're fairly easy to read, but also because he did find some of the more obscure things and some things that maybe you're not as familiar with. So the presentation is really broad and you can come away reading this with like a fairly decent understanding of Norse mythology. Um, and it's it's really cool. It's really like I found it really fascinating. We actually read this for my book club, which my the book club that I run is fantasy and science fiction. So my book club doesn't challenge me that often because they're books that I would probably read anyway. But I was like, let's let's do something different this year. Let's pick a nonfiction. And we went way outside our comfort zone and read North, <laughs> North <laughs> mythology, which, like I said, not so much a stretch, but just, you know, kind of cool and like. If you're not familiar with Norse mythology, if, if all you know is, you know, Thor from the Marvel movies, that makes Thor seem a lot more heroic than he is. And Thor is a really important character and he is really heroic, but he's also kind of a jerk. And a lot of the things he does are, you know, not great. 
um, same with all the characters. They're they're much more like if you're at all familiar with like Greek mythology or you know the Roman mythology or pretty much any other myth you know mythological creatures and characters and the Norse follow the same kind of thing. We're like they're not all good or all bad. They're all a little bit gray, <laughs> yeah. and that's good and it's fun. And he he presents it really really nicely and understandably and. and just much more kind of not conversationally but like definitely it's an approachable volume if you're at all interested in this and if you like neil gaiman to begin with his writing style translates really really well to this myths so i i really loved this book um i thought it was a nice interpretation of this these myths and for a non-fiction reader it was a really good one <laughs> <laughs> you're like yep Got got my nonfiction reading. I, I read some nonfiction. You know, I always feel proud of myself when I read something that's not in my comfort zone. I'm like, it's yeah. mythology, so I'm not, you know, how nonfictiony it is. But technically, <laughs> but it's not fiction. Technically, it is. <laughs> it, it's got a Dewey number when it gets exactly. put on the shelf. It's not in with the. <laughs> so exactly. there you go. <laughs> Thank oh you, God. Jen. <laughs> Um, and for me, so things that are in my wheelhouse, if you've been listening to this for any time at all, um, I like horror, I like um, psychological suspense novels, I like mysteries. Those are the things I'm going to naturally pick up. Um, along with that, you know, maybe a graphic novel in here. And then sometimes I like um, historical fiction, particularly historical fiction that centers a powerful woman of some sort. So these two are not really in my wheelhouse, and I'm actually kind of surprised that I picked them up at all because we didn't do either of them for a uh, book club. But I picked them up anyways because apparently I was in that mood at the time. So my first one is historical fiction. So that's sort of in there, but it is historical fiction set during World War II. Um, and I have read a lot of historical fiction set during World War II, but usually it is because we have chosen it for book club, not because it's something that I'm going to pick up, because I tend to avoid, when I'm reading for myself, I tend to avoid books that are going to make me feel bad. And I don't, that's not a great description, but World War II is a point in human history where the worst evil that man can do is presented and so I don't tend to pick those up because it's almost too real. I can read a horror novel and it's pretend and I know it's pretend. Um, reading about World War II is, is it's hard and those are hard reads and I don't want a hard read when I'm just trying to escape. But I picked this one up and I'm still not entirely sure how it ended up in my hands. I don't know if I read a really great review or I heard about it on a podcast and I was like, yeah, that sounds good. Um, I could also have been going through a PBS masterpiece phase where they were doing television shows with um, various characters during World War II on the home front in London. So I don't know if I heard about it there. But if you need a World War II novel that's going to leave you with hope, Dear Mrs. Bird is fabulous for that. So it's set in 1940s London. The Blitz is about to begin. And Emmy is in her early 20s. And she wants to be doing something. But she's not sure what that something is. And she is good at writing. And so she decides she could be a journalist. So she goes and starts applying to papers. And of course, she's a woman. And nobody's particularly interested in what she can do. And so she gets to one paper and the man says, sure, I've got a job for you. And she's so excited. And it turns out that she is going to be sorting the letters for the advice columnist, Mrs. Bird. And so she goes in and it is her job to pick through the letters and decide which ones Mrs. Bird is going to respond to. Well, Mrs. Bird is a very um, practical woman set in her ways. And she does not want Emmy giving her any letters with any unpleasantness. We don't discuss sex. We don't discuss divorce. We don't discuss um, men returning from the war and struggling with the things that they've seen. Like, And she literally gives Emmy a list and says, don't give me any letters with any of this in there. And so Emmy starts her job. 
And of course, there are letters in there that she reads and it, they're heartbreaking. And so Emmy secretly starts replying to the letters as though she's Mrs. Bird, but they don't get published in the paper. Until there's one that she kind of can't resist and she feels that it needs a public reply and maybe a mistake was made and it ends up getting published. So, so that's Emmy's work life. Emmy's also got a best friend named Bunty. And of course they're going through the blitz. And I really, I don't know if I was just on the right frame of mind, but I really ended up loving this book. My Goodreads review says it's lovely. All of the characters are well drawn, wonderful to read about. And yes, there's tragedy in here too. Um, and I don't want to make it feel like they gloss over it or don't have real human feelings, but they deal with it in a way that lets you see the, the hopeful, kind, compassionate side of humans that is there when tragedy occurs. Um, and I feel sometimes we move too quickly past that when we're looking at these hard times in history. Um, again, going back to Mr. Rogers, looking for the helpers. And I feel like this book really focuses on the helpers during a really hard time in history. And there is a sequel forthcoming this year called Cheerfully Yours. So there will be more adventures with Emmy and Bunty in the sequel. So I am looking forward to that. The other book I chose is not my comfort zone at all. But I can't, I don't even know why I picked it up if I was just like, hey, I really like this cover or, you know, I'm real tired of reading about haunted houses. So let's pick something that's the opposite of that. So the other title that I chose is The Royal We by Heather Cox and Jessica Morgan. And it is exactly what it looks like. It is a chick lit romance novel. Um, it and that's what it's pure that it's been described as Kate and William fan fiction. This is prior to all of the Harry and Meghan, all of that that's going on right now. This was written, I don't know, I don't have the date here, but I would say this is probably six, seven or more years ago that this was written. Um, and, and really like people who are really into the Royals have pretty much said it's pretty much Kate and William's story, except Kate has now been turned into an American. America. So <laughs> instead we get Rebecca Porter and she has a twin sister, Lacey, and Rebecca goes to school at Oxford. And while she's at Oxford, who happens to be living near her, but the Prince of England, who of course meets her and finds her fascinating with all of her weird American ways. And so they fall in love. And of course, you know, she's young and she doesn't think about all the pressures that are going to come with suddenly being involved with, you know, the Prince of England. So and then there's a whole bunch of, you know, royal family drama that goes on. So I picked it up and I really enjoyed it. It is the fluffiest of romantic fluffiness, but it's so fun. And I think I was just ready in that moment to just read something fun where the people inevitably are going to end up with some sort of happy ending and you can just close the book and go, that was lovely. And, and maybe never think about it again, because you don't have to. You can just have enjoyed that moment with the book. There does happen to be a sequel to this one. I have not read the sequel, so I can't speak to that. But the first one was very fun. Um, and if you like, I think I might have been going through a Royals phase during that time, maybe. <laughs> so I was like, ooh, let's pick up this one. If you like the Royals and you want some romance with the Royals as a background, it's worth reading. It's just fun and easy. So thank you to all of you for sharing your books outside your comfort zone. And we will be back in two weeks to talk about, and this one I feel is going to be challenging, but I chose it because April is National Poetry Month. So we will be back in two weeks to talk about our favorite poetry, plays, essays, or short story collections. So I went beyond poetry because personally I would have a hard time finding a book of poetry because I'm not a poetry person, but I love hearing about other people who love poetry and what they have found that's fabulous. So we'll be sharing that next time and thanks for listening and we hope you have great weeks. Bye.